All right. Welcome, welcome. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on where you're watching from. Um, my name is um, Just Clerk Morissette. They call me Just for short. Um, let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Leon Daniels. Hey, Jiz, you might want to hold off real quick. It sounds like you switched back to your other microphone. No? Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and I'm Leon Daniels, and uh, we're here with Go Broke Investing uh, platform here that's here to help you and inform you on the different tools of the trade. Definitely. Um, we'll be talking about one of the things we wanted to do is kind of set the stage and have these um, episodes start off. Um, with basic discussions and then get a little deeper dive as we go on episode to episode. So um, as um, Leon just said, we wanted to just talk about first, if you're new to investing, um, how do you get involved in investing? What is your investment style? Most people don't know that they should try to identify their investment style because that will help you in the long run when somebody comes to you with an idea a particular stock, a particular crypto, if that's what you're into, or just um, a, a venture. It'll help you decide whether it's something that you should take part in because your personality, your risk tolerance will be one of the first things that you say yes or no, whether you want to move forward with it. And then, of course, what are some of the platforms that are out there that you can take advantage of that um, are available to the retail investor that's um, individuals like you and I um, for us to invest in. That's right. So, uh, you know, the, the real basis for this episode is, you know, strategies and platforms that will help you achieve your investment goals. So the first thing that we wanted to talk about was developing a strategy. So, you know, just do you want to, you want to cover that? You want to jump into strategies? Yeah. So um, as we're saying, it's very similar. A lot of people say, what is your risk tolerance? If you go to speak to um, a financial planner, if you go speak to, um, you know, an investment company, they'll sit you down and they'll try to understand how much money are you working with, right? Depending on if you have hundreds of dollars that you're putting in, are you putting in a lump sum? Are you, you know, putting in a few hundred a month, a few thousand a month? What is the amount that you're looking to invest? And then, um, what is the goal? What is your goal for this money? Some people say, I want to um, put this money in and I want it to accrue a certain amount of interest or I want it to double. What is your timeline for that growth? Is it six months? Is it a year? Is it five years? Is it 10 years? Because that's going to determine how aggressive you want to invest it, right? If you have a 10-year plan, you don't need to go hard, right? You can, you can yeah. do you know, 2%, 3%, 5% a month, you know, 10% a month is, is not too aggressive. But if you're saying, hey, um, for whatever reason, I want to double this money in like five years, you, you got to go aggressive, right? So again, understanding that when you go aggressive, you're, you're trying to grow aggressively, but there's also a risk of losing aggressively. So right. that's the thing that people have to be realistic with is sometimes what you want, you're not able to get because the market, what's available to you, the investment opportunities, there's nothing really safe that's gonna give you good growth, um, you know, amazing growth. <laughs> Anything that's gonna give you um, mind-blowing profits is gonna be risky. Right. So that's one thing that people have to understand. No one can guarantee you safety. No right. one can guarantee you safety. So. Um, one of the things they always say as well is, you know, this shouldn't be something that is going to um, put you in the poorhouse if you lose it. Right. So you shouldn't be investing your mortgage money, your rent money, right. your grocery money to the point where now if it doesn't turn out the way you, you're hoping, you're, you're out of a house. Right. Right. And this, I always say this should be disposable income. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It should be the income that you have to the side and in, in that you're looking to invest mm -hmm. and save. And you, when you invest that money, it should be, I'm okay with losing this amount of money. 
Yeah. You know, and if you're not okay with it, maybe you're not an aggressive investor. Maybe you're more of a, 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 a conservative investor and you put yourself in like a low yield, you know, ETF or something like that. So, um, but in, in my opinion, what's disposable income? Well, you know, like I've told friends, do you buy a bottle of bourbon every week? Do you buy Starbucks every day? Do you buy, that's, that's all, that's all stuff that, I mean, yes, you're, you're spending it, but what if I told you, you know, that $10 or $8 you spend on that Starbucks drink could, you could grow, Mm -hmm. um, by investing it. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a matter of your mindset and what you want to do. You know, can you go a a couple of, and, and when you drink that drink or eat that food, it's gone. Yeah. There's (laughs) that money's gone. It's not growing. It's not working for you. So, you know, it just really depends on your mindset and what you want, like you were saying. So really that breaks down into a few categories, right? Are you going to be a short-term investor? Are you going to be a long-term investor? Um, Or are you just looking to be a hobbyist? Some people are all three. Yeah. And and that's (laughs) the thing, I guess, a good starting point too, is is to make a budget, right? Right. Um, We do know a lot of people, um, people who have money, people who are, are tight with money based on their income, based on their lifestyle, right? You could be making $100,000 a year and don't have two pennies to rub together because of yep. how you spend your money. So I know I know a lot of broke hundred thousandaires. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. <laughs> is, um, one of the things that some people say is if you're living okay and you like the way you're living, you're living within your means, but you do have some disposable income and you're not comfortable investing it, then maybe there's something you can do to gain another um, stream of income and use that additional stream of income. So you have people who are um, who do gig work and they use the profit from their gig work to invest, right? Right. So if you're, let's say you- you Uber, something like that, Uber, yeah. yeah. Or or whatever talent that you have, you know, maybe, you know, there's people who who do, they do blogs or they write, freelance write, you know, all different types of things that people can do outside of their normal income stream. And then now maybe that's a couple hundred dollars a week, uh, you know, a couple thousand dollars a week, whatever it is. But now that's income. You again, like just like you said, you don't have to stretch because right. that wasn't part of your normal income to begin with your family's income to begin with. So right. when you have that, that it's a level, there's no pressure there because if it's income that you have, that is part of your family's um, balance your checking and savings, if that if investment doesn't grow the way you want it to grow, or it goes south for the next few months or so, not saying that the investment is bad, but you're not getting the returns that you want, you're going to start stressing, right? Right. Yeah. A lot of, and a lot of this, a lot of investing sometimes is just patience. Mm-hmm. And so, and I would say one of the top things, I mean, one of the top things I even had to learn from the very get was that mm-hmm. sometimes you have to take a little bit of emotion out of it. Mm-hmm. And trading is very, very psychological and, and mental in a way. And so um, a lot of people panic mm-hmm. and they don't know what to do. And so um, that kind of brings us to our next topic is, you know, once you've settled on a strategy, mm-hmm what's the complexity of your strategy or, or what's, how, how do you set your strategy up? And this really depends on people, right? If, if you're an analytical person who likes to be in the details, you're going to love, you know, different tools than the person who just wants to just passively invest. And I just want a you know, small return or I want a you know, large return, but I don't want to have to do the work. You know, there are multiple vehicles for each one of those types of investors. Um, so again, to recap, we got short term and long term and, and hobbyists. And then we got the complexity. Are you going to be analytical or keep it simple? Are you going to be active investor or a passive investor? Those all come into play before even choosing a platforms that you're going to go with to invest in <laughs> all those things. So some yeah. people just like to fire up a Robin Hood and go mm-hmm. without having a real plan of what they're going to do. 
Yeah, and, and I think regardless of the investment, there has to be some patience involved. Right. Right. If it's if it's a legal investment, <laughs> most of the time those investments um they they swing back and forth. Nothing nothing goes up just from the start. So you're gonna have what they call you know pullbacks in the market, where you know some people panic, and you have to be able to to ride out those those dips, and that's where again your risk tolerance comes in. If you're expecting, if you're expecting to get um, ten percent, fifteen percent per year in an investment, you know month to month you're not gonna see that growth that you want. And one of the things you want to be disciplined in is not always checking your, your investments and your balances on a daily and weekly basis because it, it will drive you crazy. Are you there? Yeah. I don't know if I lost you or you lost me. I don't know. <laughs> All right. So I was just talking about... Um, it looks like I lost you, but um, it was still recording. But um, what I was saying was just, um, you want to, when you have your investment goal and you say that you're investing and you want to see how it does in a year or two years, is that you don't want to be on top of your investment and, and checking it out every day, every right. week, because you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy because you won't see that growth. It's not going to be incremental. Like every week it went up by 1% or 2%. And so understanding that there will be days where your investment takes um, a step back before it takes two steps forward. Right. And I want to, I want to jump back to the mental aspect mm -hmm. of it. When, when you're, when you're investing and you say, I want to go with this company mm -hmm. or in crypto, I want to go with this coin. Mm -hmm. um, if you've done your due diligence and you've done your research, mm -hmm. when you decide to invest, it should be, that's it. You invest it and you move on. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because you've done your research and then um, you just let it go. And then if it, if it dips or, or something like that, or if it loses money, um, maybe you invest more because you've done the research, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's, that's something that I've learned and something that I think people should learn is, is that once you've invested, leave it alone mm -hmm. until, uh, you know, you're ready to pull it out or it's hit a benchmark that you set a certain amount of money. You know what I mean? So. Yeah, that was something that we touched upon in the previous episode where we talked about um, mistakes that um, novice investors make in that something happens with the company that they're investing in and it could be a hiccup in their life cycle. And of course the news is all over it making it seem like it's the end of the world. And, right. You know, some people say it's done on purpose to, to shake up the market, to, to get the um, novice investors out of the market. And then, you know, the big money comes in because the price dropped and it's now on sale, right? And exactly right. what you said, if, you, if you've done your homework, a hiccup by a company is an opportunity for you to buy again, to, to double down on your investment because they'll recover from that hiccup. Right. So let's take, for instance, um, let's, let's take an example. Mm -hmm. Boeing. Mm -hmm. Boeing had a lot of aircraft crashes mm -hmm. over the past few years. Mm -hmm. They were grounded. They had the FAA involvement. Yeah. And Boeing stock mm -hmm. just plummeted. It mm -hmm. just, it just, it was, it was constantly every day it was bleeding red. Mm -hmm. But what do we know about Boeing? We know that they're going to keep making planes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we know that they're going to keep getting government contracts. Yeah. And we know that they're going to have a consistent source of revenue. Mm -hmm. This is just a hiccup for them. Yeah. Um, and in this case, maybe that hiccup is two years or three years. Yeah. So you just got to look at it and go, okay, can I weather the storm of two or three years? Do I want to take the loss? Mm -hmm. Do I want to invest more in it? Because I know eventually they'll go back up. Mm -hmm. um, but Boeing isn't going anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and you know that because you, you see, I mean, half these airplanes that you're flying in, 
every day are Boeings. Mm -hmm. And so you've done your due diligence. So that's kind of, that's kind of an example. Yeah. Um, um, to piggyback on that is a great example because um, for me, I'm not invested in Boeing. I've actually had discussions with people in my network about that. And I'm looking to get in on Boeing and I'm actually waiting for them to settle the lawsuit because I feel that's when they're going to hit bottom. When the announcement right. comes out and they've already had some discussions about um, whether or not they're going to try to do a lump sum payment. And I believe some of the lawyers have come together and said, no, we want individual payments because they want Boeing to, to pay by the nose. And it's going to be a large amount. And that large amount, again, is going to scare the market. They're going to right. say, you know, how is Boeing going to recover? Do they, can they cover that lawsuit payment? Will they have to take out loans? Whatever it is, it's going to be negative news, which will cause the stock to go down. And that's when I'm going to get it. Right. And that, that happened. Uh, a perfect example of that is, uh, I think it was Qualcomm and Apple mm -hmm. had a lawsuit back and forth mm -hmm. going. Mm -hmm. And Apple whenever news would come out that like Qualcomm was doing better in the lawsuit, Apple stock would tank, <laughs> you know what I mean? But is, is Apple going anywhere? No, they have a <laughs> tough ecosystem, mm -hmm. but their stock would tank and I would just buy more. Mm -hmm. um, and then the Qualcomm, I think, I think they eventually won the lawsuit mm -hmm. and their stock, their stock rocketed up mm -hmm. like the day it was announced <laughs> that there was a settlement or, or something like that. And so, if you're if you're playing the markets and you're analytical and you're in and you're researching, mm -hmm. okay, who are they in a lawsuit with? So if if this person wins, their stock's gonna rocket and I can get this other stock for cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, or or if they lose, this other stock's gonna rocket and I, you know, I can get their stock for cheap. Yeah. So, you know, playing both sides of the fence mm -hmm. um, is something that I did with that quell. I made out pretty well with the Qualcomm Apple mm -hmm. thing. So that's, that's a perfect example. Yeah. But so what does all this mean, right? Once you have all this put together, the next thing that you want to figure out is what platform am I using? Because there's a million platforms and I know people are always like asking me, what am I using? What platforms am, am I using? Mm -hmm. uh, and Jiz and I talk all the time about it. <laughs> there's so many different platforms. Mm -hmm. Just in crypto alone, there's probably you know, dozens. And then, um, you know, you've got TD, you've got Fidelity, you got that, these different, you have Robin Hood, mm -hmm. you got these different things. So it really boils down to once you have a strategy in place, what system are you going to use? Mm -hmm. um, so without, without, fur like, without further ado, we can kind of go in and start, start breaking this down. Um, one note, to anybody who's listening um, that me and uh, Jiz and I were talking about were, was Yahoo Finance, the app. Mm -hmm. That's just a great all around app, right? If you're, if you're one of those people that are really, really into researching um, and digging in, Yahoo Finance is a great app because they're going to push you updates all throughout the day. Anytime something happens with a company, you're going to know. They also allow you to log into your Fidelity account, your Robinhood account, your TD Ameritrade account, your Schwab account, and it will pull back all your stocks that are in your portfolio. And so if you had stocks, maybe a little bit in Robinhood, a little bit over here in TD, now all those stocks are in one location. You can monitor them real time. You could see, you can click on each one and see the news, see what you're gaining, see what you're losing. And so again, that's going to be your more active type investor who wants to be more involved. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's where I would start. If I was going to tell anybody to start, download Yahoo Finance mm -hmm. or some sort of app. There's, I think Market Watch is another one, yeah. but hands down, I think Yahoo Finance is the best. Yeah, I, so, I, I, I try to do um, multiple different, well, not just, not for tracking, you're talking about tracking. Um, for me, I like, you said market watch, I go to um, MSNBC just, right. for, just for research. So when I just try to see what's going on in the overall market, the global economy, what's going on in the um, US economy, what are the major happenings in a major corporation. So um, I like that. I go to Bloomberg um, as well. 
So I try to get different sources. I even go to um, Forbes um, a lot of times and I'll just Google, you know, Google um, um, business. So you go to Google News and then the subheading business and then it gives you a bunch of the top headlines or what's um, trending. So right. It'll, it'll help direct you to a lot of those different news sites because it, it aggregates them from the different um, media um, companies. Yeah, and I would say like, if you get news updates on your phone, mm-hmm. even that mm-hmm. is is great because, you know, Apple sends out like these little updates, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from from different news sources. Mm-hmm. And I'm, you know, most people will read their those those alerts and go, oh, OK, cool. That's going on. Um, but for me, I read the alert and go, how's that? How's that going to affect? Yeah. all the companies involved how's that gonna affect yeah. you know where can i move in the market but that's just how i'm kind of wired mm-hmm. right not everybody's wired that way but um just being informed is the best yeah. way to start yeah so um just do you want to kind of break down the crypto platforms and why you use what you use and yep. in things of that nature there's there's so much happening right now in crypto and just like with regular stocks some of them are user friendly some of them are not user friendly the other level with crypto is ownership right so you want to know if you're using a platform is that platform um just giving you access to crypto so that you can play around with it and then if you try to take it to another platform will they allow you to do that so um, you have like one of the newer platforms, like Robin. Can I can I can I can I break that down r- yeah. real quick with yeah. you? Can you, when you say take it with me, what do you mean? So when we're talking crypto, about crypto, yeah. What when you're talking about crypto? Um, traditionally, crypto was made so that if you have a coin and you buy a coin, let's say you buy um Bitcoin or percentages of Bitcoin, it's yours. It's just like if you go to, um, you know, the store and you you get change, that's your your change. It's yours, right? The the store doesn't own your change. It's your change. So if I go to an exchange and I buy some Bitcoin, it's my Bitcoin. Now, where am I holding that Bitcoin? So if you're using a platform and you buy some Bitcoin and you're holding it, that platform is holding it for you or they own it outright and you don't have ownership of it. So you're in order for you to do anything with it, you basically have to liquidate your Bitcoin and turn it back into dollars, whether it's US dollars or whatever country you're in, back into traditional currency. And now you've lost the value of having a cryptocurrency. So if you so like when we tell people, a lot of people are are really um, they love Robinhood. It's a new app that's been around for a few years now. They've used it for stocks, and that's great. It's gotten a lot of people into investing in stocks, and then they updated their offerings and allow people to buy crypto. The problem is you don't own it. You can use it. You can invest it, but in order for you to take that crypto and do something outside of the Robinhood platform, you have to sell it back into dollars. So that's not what um, crypto, and that's not what Bitcoin was traditionally used for. You should be able to transfer it to another platform, send it to someone if you want to send it to someone, or just store it anywhere because it's yours. You can say, I don't want it on Robinhood. I have a, another platform, another digital wallet, and I just want to transfer it to another digital wallet. Some of these exchanges don't let you do that. So you have to educate yourself on what are the capabilities of these accounts. And what will they let you do? What won't they let you do with your funds? Right. So, so let's back up. Mm-hmm. When you talked about a digital wallet, mm-hmm. what what do you mean by that? So basically, crypto um, cryptocurrency is just coded currency. So that it has value in it, and people have accepted that the dif- different coins have value to them. So it is a, a currency, digital currency. So when I say I have $100 worth of Bitcoin, it's that transaction when I converted and bought, whether I took a, um, American dollars and I bought some Bitcoin, it was 
codified on what they call the blockchain or ledger that is now permanent. That transaction is permanent and is saying that it's mine. So now that is, there's an actual key, there's, whether it's a public key or a private key that stores that transaction that is associated with an owner. So if you're using a platform like Robinhood, the private keys, the keys of ownership to that transaction is Robinhood. You, the person I have, if I create a Robinhood account and I bought crypto on Robinhood, the, the keys to that transaction are not mine, it's Robinhood's. So if we were to provide like a, let's provide a real world example. Mm -hmm. So what, what, you, what you're saying and, and what he is saying is, um, it's the difference between letting somebody hold your money for you and you holding your own money, right? Mm -hmm. Say, you know, when you're young, your parents would be like, uh, you know, can I have $10? And they would hold it for you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It'd be in their wallet. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what he's saying, you know, that you have access to that capital, you have access to that cash, you can ask your parents to take it out whenever you, you want. Mm -hmm. However, um, some folks like to have actually physically have their, <laughs> their cash. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference in what he's talking about. So when you look at platforms, like I think, what is it, Cash App, mm -hmm. and you look at um, Robinhood, mm -hmm. they're holding that, mm -hmm. that stuff for you. And so uh what he's saying is it's like say you don't want to liquidate your mm -hmm. ethereum mm -hmm. right how else will you get that money out mm -hmm. or how else will you transfer that money mm -hmm. whereas other platforms you physically hold it in maybe their wallet in their store or you're holding it in your wallet your physical wallet or you know your digital wallet on your phone and um, it's yours to send and transact with in the outside world. Maybe I want to pay a plumber in Ethereum, mm -hmm. or maybe I want to play, you know, pay somebody in Bitcoin. You can't do that with Robinhood because that you would have to liquidate back into cash money, American dollars, mm -hmm. and to do that. Whereas other platforms, you know, you're just transacting. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference, right? So like if you're if you're one of those people that's like, I don't care about that, Robinhood's still a good place mm -hmm. to, to do it. It's just, just know you'll never actually, you know, physically have it until they, they get with the program and maybe have wallets or something yeah. like that, There's or a way for you to. They're, they're looking into that in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so when I started investing in crypto, I started on Robinhood mm -hmm. and Jiz and I talked and it was like, you know, he, he initially I was trading on Robinhood and I was like, I'm just going to make money or hold it and, and, and things of that nature. But then I started to understand number one, Robinhood's limited on crypto. I think they have like five. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then you go into a, a Coinbase mm -hmm. or a Kraken mm -hmm. and they have hundreds, <laughs> hundreds and people are making money and you're like, ah, <laughs> like I'm missing out on this. Yeah, so yeah. again, you know, it, it's how far you want to get into. If you're like, man, I ain't I'm not into crypto like that. Mm -hmm. I'm okay just holding Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I want stocks. Mm -hmm. Robinhood is perfect for you. Mm -hmm. It's perfect mm -hmm. because it has kind of the best of both worlds and it has like the top two top two coins, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's that was something I just really felt like we needed to break down. Yeah. So, um, so what do you use? What, what are you using? Um, one of my main platforms is crypto.com. Mm -hmm. So, um, a lot of people like to use Coinbase. I used to use Coinbase. I don't use them so much anymore because a lot of the coins that they use is, um, part of the Ethereum network. So that's not a negative thing. Um, Ethereum is really large. They have a great platform. The problem is whenever you try to use anything associated with, so Ethereum is, is what's called um, like a custodial coin, right? So it is a parent coin and then people use their platform to create other coins because they want to do different things. Right. So they're like, they're like, think of it as, um, as descendants of Ethereum. 
So because they're descendants of Ethereum, they they need whenever you you buy one, you need to um there's a fee associated with that, and you need Ethereum to pay that fee. So um one of let's let's say I want to um I want to buy Polkadot. Polkadot is a is a coin off of the Ethereum network. I would have to go to an exchange and then I would have to get some Ethereum and swap that Ethereum to Polkadot. In that swapping, there's going to be minor fees associated with that. And then they call it gas fees in the Ethereum network. They call it gas fees. Because Ethereum is now so popular, the fees have actually gone up because you have to now, you're pretty much having to, to um, almost, you have to, you're paying these miners to get their attention. I want you to do my transaction. And then somebody else is like, no, I want you to do my transaction. So the fees go up because there's only so few um, miners who can handle the transactions. And that is a problem that Ethereum is working on in getting the fees down, but in working in their network with any of their coins, just to move a coin, you have to pay Ethereum fees. Right. So that's why, like you said, there are other options out there. I don't right. necessarily need to get Polkadot unless it makes financial sense. Will right. the purchase that I'm making, will the fees make it obsolete? Or am I getting enough Polkadot that the fees don't matter? Right? Right. So And so, mm -hmm. and, and so like, you know, I use Coinbase quite a mm -hmm. bit. Um, Coinbase is that kind of intermediate next level. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, we talked about Robinhood mm -hmm. and your surface, but maybe maybe one day you want to actually start getting into the, the coins and stuff like that. Coinbase would be your next like logical step. It's very easy, very simple. And you can transact between coins, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. you know, say you have a coin, so many dollars of a coin and you want to swap to another coin, they'll let you swap between coins, mm -hmm. right? And that fee... Mm -hmm. is has always been free except for if it's like stable coins yeah. i think they had an issue with but coinbase would be your next logical step right so mm -hmm. once you feel researched in enough in um crypto you can you can say okay i want to kind of get off robin hood because it's not it's not meeting you know it's not you know meeting my needs and i want to go to coinbase and then but there's also you know there's kraken mm -hmm. There's T0, mm -hmm. there's crypto.com. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure I've missed, there's Gemini. Yeah. There's all these different exchanges, right? Where you can go buy mm -hmm. cryptocurrency at, right? Mm -hmm. So just make sure that you're, you're looking at every single one of these exchanges and what they have to offer, Yeah. right? And right now everybody wants everybody's yeah. Binance. I forgot Binance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everybody wants um your attention mm -hmm. right so like look think of these exchanges like um like a robin hood like a td ameritrade like a fidelity they all have their pluses and minuses mm -hmm. but at the end of the day they all kind of do the same thing right and that's that's kind of what we're getting at right so um if you actually want to own your coin you're going to go to one of these exchanges, yeah. right? And that's, that's the beautiful thing about it. Is, and what we, we're hoping to... Um, or I should say phys physical custody of your coin, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that we're trying to impress upon people is with crypto um, currency, you're in control until you give up, willingly give up that control. So right. the benefit of these exchanges is that they, they want your money in their platform, on their platform, because it just helps their operations run smoother to have more and more right. money running through their system. It's what is called liquidity. So right. the more and more money that's running through a Coinbase, the, the smoother their platform works as opposed to a Kraken. They want more liquidity as well. So they're going to give rewards and incentives for mm -hmm. you to work with their network. You bring up a valid point. I want to I want to talk about some of some of these exchanges have minimum buy points mm -hmm. for these coins. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing to consider, right? Mm -hmm. You you can't just go in there and say I want to spend 
five dollars for this amount they may say no you the minimum here is fifty dollars mm -hmm. so that's something that you want to look at crypto kind of has minimums and they and they 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 set their minimums. Kraken has minimums. Mm -hmm. um, so Coinbase really doesn't have, in Gemini, really, they really don't have minimums. So they're, that's why I say they're the next logical step mm -hmm. before you move into the, the deeper marketplaces. Mm -hmm. um, so, but let's talk about stocks. So what are you using for, for your traditional stocks? Me, me personally, I have a TD Ameritrade account. I've had them for over 20 years. Um, I, I like them. Um, really, really no complaints. All right. No complaints from that platform. Yeah. So, so really any of the, the big, mm -hmm. you know, houses, Charles Schwab, mm -hmm. Fidelity, TD, their uh, uh, E-Trade, those are going to be great for stocks and trading. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I have a, I do have a Robinhood account. Mm -hmm. I'll say this, Robinhood has made it easy mm -hmm to <laughs> Robinhood has made it easy for investors, but easy isn't necessarily safe all the time. Yeah. Right. We saw what happened kind of with GameStop mm -hmm. and um, understanding margins and understanding options and things of those, um, you know, I think Robinhood's kind of given those keys away more freely. Mm -hmm. And when I started on Fidelity, you couldn't, they weren't just going to give you yeah. Yeah. the options or margin accounts, mm -hmm. they wanted to know that you were savvy and that you understood what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And in a way, Robinhood said, no, we're not gonna be that as aggressive as these, and they've made it easy for people, mm -hmm. but it's also easy for people to get in trouble. Yeah. So yeah. Um, Robinhood, at, for as good as it is, you see what happened with GameStop and mm -hmm. how they had to get, uh, Bailed basically out. bailed out uh they, i think they had to borrow like six billion dollars or something mm -hmm. like that or I, I forget what the amount is that's because of what jizz would go back to what jizz was talking about with liquidity mm -hmm. like they were having a little bit of a liquidity crisis mm -hmm. uh <laughs> there was there was more money changing hands than they they had to cover everything yeah and so that's why you saw stuff like you couldn't just buy something, you couldn't just deposit money and then buy something. Mm -hmm. They had stopped that. Before you could deposit money and they'd wait for it to clear from your bank account. They wouldn't even wait. They just give you access to that capital. Mm -hmm. But as you saw with the GameStop thing, they stopped doing that. They were holding people's funds for mm -hmm. days and days. That is the prototypical whole, oh my gosh, we've ran out of money. We're, <laughs> we're out of capital. Uh, we need to slow things down um, and let everything catch up. Yeah. So with the big, bigger houses, it's going to be hard. They, they don't have those types of problems. Yeah. yeah right. And that's, and that's the dynamic that um, is changing. We're in a very fluid investment space right now. Like you said, a lot of these rules are changing. GameStop um, what happened with them, what happened with Robin Hood and what Robin Hood is trying to petition is for some of the rules to change. Not all of the rules, but they, they feel that some of the rules negatively impact um, novice investors. Mm -hmm. they, of course, they want to make it easier for you to um, run around in the investment space, but they're saying like some of the transactions and how the transactions happen and the transparency of those transactions isn't the way that they would like it to make their service better. And they say it right. benefits the, the traditional investment companies and hurts the retail investors, which right. I kind of agree with them, but I do feel that they should probably have um, raised the bar on who they allow to do margins trading. So a lot of people say that, you know, um, Robin Hood is gamified. Right. You come on there and there's all of these incentives and all of these contests and mm -hmm. all of this stuff, which kind of turns investing into a video game. And then there you have people coming in there, not recognizing the risk that they're in. And then, you know, you get a, a short gain here, a short gain there. You, right. sh you should take your profits. But hey, let me see if I could 10x that. Let me see if I could 20x yeah. that. So you get a yeah. lot of people who don't really understand it. And it's, it's cool. It's fun. And it's addicting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, Robinhood is definitely different. Even the way their user interface is, it's just, it's very nice. It's very fluid. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to do stuff and it, it takes you through it. Mm -hmm. But again, you, you need to be researching before you, you know, start doing the, <laughs> don't, don't just take, you know, do, do margins and, and don't know what a margin is mm -hmm. or margin calls are. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, Oh, one thing that you touched on that I want to talk about is um, I'm going to go back to Coinbase mm -hmm. and a few other Coinbase. One thing that I really like about them is they offer these educational resources. Mm -hmm. And so you can go on there and earn crypto mm -hmm. just by learning about crypto. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Like I started the class, I started when I first got on Coinbase, I started the classes because I was like, I just want this money. Mm -hmm. But then I started like actually listening to their videos. They have videos, they have stuff you can read, they have quizzes. And mm -hmm. I was like, man, there's actual good use case for this one, or this one makes sense. Oh, okay. I see what they're doing here. Um, so take advantage of that. I mean, that's free money. Yeah. So um, take advantage of that. But uh, I think that pretty much that pretty much covered. We talked about everything that we in the different platforms that you can use. Um, you know, Jiz, where can they reach you at if they have questions? Well, um, I have a Facebook group. So if you if you go on um Facebook, and it's building generational wealth. So it's Facebook, facebook.com slash groups, and then it's um slash building gw so then you'll see it or you it should be pretty easy to i understand that there's a, a couple of other groups out there that use the name but you should see my name on there you should see some of the videos and pictures on there to find it um one of the things i wanted to say too before we close is do some research right there's some pretty um consistent some pretty well-known investing strategies that can be used for both crypto and for traditional stocks, right? Everybody yeah. talks about um, Warren Buffett. You can't go wrong researching Warren Buffett. You can't go wrong researching his investment style. You'll find his stuff in libraries online. It's a great place to start and with everything, you know, you take it, try to apply it and tweak it to your personality, to your style. But you need a strategy so that you're not just out there um, trying to swing home runs every time you step up to, to bat, right? So that's, yeah. that's one of the things I wanted to say as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, when I first started investing, that's what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't understand, you know, and I think in baseball, mm -hmm. um, even there's this thing called um, RBIs. Mm -hmm runners batted in mm -hmm. and excuse me sorry mm -hmm. so um sometimes in your investment strategy it's not about the home runs mm -hmm. sometimes it's just about you know winning a little bit at a time and you you stack up 10 or 20 wins in a row and you're doing great mm -hmm. you know and you don't have to be as aggressive and swing for the fences i know plenty of investors that they swing for the fences. Um, I don't. Mm -hmm. I look for small wins and small victories. <clears throat> That's just something that uh, fits my style, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the aggressive home run hitters, that's what fits their style. And I don't knock them for it because they're good at what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just not. <laughs> I'm not good at, you know, let's just, you know, I'll jump in on, on this or whatnot. So I was out on GameStop. Mm -hmm. I just watched the whole thing happen. <laughs> You know, uh, that's some scary, that was scary water for me, you yeah. know, and I was yeah. like, no, nah, that's okay. You know, I'll just hang out here and watch everybody <laughs> do their thing. But guess what? Several people became millionaires behind that. Yeah. yeah. And guess what? Thousands of people became broke behind yep. that. Yep. <laughs> yep. And, that's, and that's the thing is, um, it's again, the, the tortoise in the hair. It's, yeah, we, we started off the call talking about what is your risk tolerance and what is your, um, you know, your time horizon. So if you're in it for a year, don't don't expect you're gonna, you know, hit a home run in a year, 
when you look out over the 10 year period, a 20 year period, and again, we're talking about stocks, we're talking about crypto, there, there is um, stock, there are stocks out there that are doing really well. Mm -hmm. And it's what, what are they doing? Why, why did this company do 20% in a year? Why did they do 50% in a year? You know, look at this pandemic and the recovery from this pandemic. Now, the, um, the media has, has gone away from talking about the stay at home stocks to the recovery stock. Right. So yeah. who, who's going to recover as yeah. we open up? Right. And, and sometimes it's about what, what your eyes see and not so much what the person on the TV says. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, is, uh, three years ago, um, people were talking about uh, Elon Musk, you know, smoking on the Joe Rogan show. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about, you know, Tesla's struggles and all its problems. Mm -hmm. And during, I think that was like 2017, 2018. During that time, I was like, man, I don't know if I want to invest in, in them. They're probably going to go belly up. <laughs> and I was passing Tesla's on the road every day. <laughs> And I would see more and more Teslas and I'd be like, you know, for a company that's not doing too hot, I keep seeing, I'm seeing more and more of these cars, it, you know, it, like five, six years ago, you would you'd see one, you know, and then maybe not see it again. But I was starting to see them all the time, all over the road. So, you know, at that time I was like, man, maybe I should just invest in Tesla. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. Mm -hmm. And that thing shot up like a rocket. Mm -hmm. And I kept saying, oh, it's going to come down. It's going to come down. <laughs> and I watched it just fly past me. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I watched people get there. There's a, I think there's a guy, <laughs> I think he made a million dollars off of mm -hmm. Tesla, off of a $40,000 investment. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't jump in. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of my first lesson of, what are your eyes telling you, mm -hmm. right? They're opening a factory in China. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're expanding mm -hmm. and they're beating sales mm -hmm. and they're beating estimates. And everybody's talking about they're overvalued, mm -hmm. right? And so that's when I started to say, okay, I need to trust what I see, mm -hmm. you know, and go, go for it. And so mm -hmm. when that thing split, I was in it. <laughs> <laughs> i was in it and i said i'm not selling it i'm not i'm not, I'm not coming out of it so um but yeah no great talk um this was good and so uh again if you have questions hit up jizz i mean i think we're gonna eventually we'll have a you know maybe an email or inbox or a, a, some sort of social media where we can um you know discuss the topics that you want to to discuss mm -hmm. you want us to talk about mm -hmm. and expand on because that's really what it is this podcast is here to inform you mm -hmm. and and we're here as a resource to you mm -hmm. to help you along your investment journey right we're not giving you financial advice mm -hmm. you know but we're here to to help to assist and to inform yeah no and on one thing i, I just want to leave with because again as you do your research you're gonna be coming across these influencers, the um, you know, the media that are gonna be giving advice. And one of the things that they love to do that we need to get away from is um the battle, whether it's David versus Goliath or it's um number one versus number two, right? Pepsi versus Coca-Cola, McDonald's versus Burger King, you know, Disney versus Netflix. It's in in all reality, it's not a versus match. It's basically which companies are doing well, why are they doing well, and will they continue to do well? Mm -hmm. So when I hear the battle all the time of Netflix versus Disney, I'm saying I own both. Yeah. <laughs> I don't yeah, think that I don't think that Netflix, <clears throat> Disney's gonna push Netflix out of business. Or people Hulu, have, or yeah. People have and both. Then, and then they're all streaming on a Roku. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's, that's the thing. So that's another reason to own Roku. <laughs> a lot of this technology has changed the way we invest and how we use them. When we look at especially media content, Disney doesn't have the offerings that Netflix has. Netflix doesn't have the offerings that Disney has. So it's not, is Disney winning over Netflix? 
It's how much are people using them and should you be right. investing in one or the other or both? <laughs> really, really, it's about streaming. What you're talking about is more about streaming market share, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and people were tired. These companies were tired of Netflix just mm -hmm. dominating mm -hmm. original content and streaming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why you've seen what they call the streaming wars. Mm -hmm. But make make no bones about it. I was on my TV last night and I flipped between Netflix, Hulu, YouTube TV, and you know, Amazon Disney. <laughs> I'm flipping between all of them. So it doesn't even matter, you know. <laughs> and guess what? If I'm flipping between all of them, that means I'm subscribed to all of them. Yep. 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 Watching on my Roku. <laughs> That's that's like five things you should be invested in. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> so, all right. Yep, yep. So, um, this hopefully we gave you guys some good value there. You know, as Leon said, um, once we get, you know, some type of feedback mechanism for you guys, um, share some comments, questions. What would you like us to discuss? Would we like us to deep diaper dive deeper <laughs> into? And um, share, you know, share these videos with your friends and family, with your network. Get that conversation going. You wanna, you want that network help you do your research and help you um vet your decisions because uh, investing shouldn't be a solo sport. Yep.